was not supposed to happen. Huh. We spent the better part of last year uh, going through the Gospel of Luke and looking at, as Luke puts it, all that Jesus began to do and teach. Uh, this morning I would like to begin looking at the book of Acts. Uh, in many ways the sequel to Luke. Looking at all that Jesus continued to do and teach. Uh, the book of Acts, in many ways, is probably one of the most indispensable books of the New Testament. And it tells us quite a bit about you know, the life of the early Christians and about what it was like to first preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to first proclaim the rule of God that had broken into this world through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this morning what I would like to do is I would like to introduce us to the book of Acts and uh, make a, a brief overview of the contents of the book of Acts, and that will kind of set us up for our future study on the book. Um, we may periodically interrupt this series, depending on the needs of uh, the congregation, but I hope to be able to uh, preach through this book on Sunday mornings. The book of Acts is kind of, a, we might say, the hinge of the New Testament. Uh, to use an analogy, it is the thing that connects one part to the other. In, in many ways, I said it is one, probably the single most indispensable book, because uh, the truth is that, you know, if you lost one of the Gospels, well, you still have three others. And if you lost one of Paul's letters, well, you still have a bunch of other letters. But if you lose the book of Acts, what do you lose? Well, what's left? Well, the content is rather unique. It is most indispensable. Without the book of Acts, we are left with a number of questions. Uh, questions that cannot be answered as we jump from the Gospels to the letters that were written by the Apostles. For instance, who is Paul? You know, you finish reading the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John... And then the next book in the Bible you read is Romans, and it's a letter by some guy named Paul to a church in Rome, and your first question you're asking is, who in the world is Paul? You don't have an answer to that question without the book of Acts. And for that matter, what in the world is Rome doing here? Where did the congregation in Rome come from? Where did the congregation in Corinth come from? Where did the congregations in Galatia come from? None of those places were mentioned in the Gospels. What are they doing here? And not only that, how did the Gentiles get involved in this? I mean, all the people that Jesus preached to were Jews. So why are there Gentiles mentioned throughout Paul's letters? And not only that, what about the promise that Jesus makes several times in the Gospels, especially in the Gospels of Luke and John, about the coming of the Holy Spirit? Where does that take place? Because you get to the end of the Gospels and the Holy Spirit has not yet come. And you read the epistles, and I think it's pretty clear from reading Paul, especially in Romans and Galatians and 1 Corinthians, that the Holy Spirit has in fact come. So what changed between now and then? Well, the book of Acts answers that question. And what about the promise of Jesus to establish His kingdom? I don't want to, you know, intrude too far into Mark's class this morning. There is, of course, a sense in which, you know, Jesus' rule is established by His resurrection from the dead. But, but, there's another sense in which His rule is still yet to really be realized. In which the kingdom is still yet to be fully consummated and inaugurated. And so in that sense, we have to ask ourselves the question... What about the promises of the kingdom that we see throughout the Old Testament and throughout the Gospels? Where does that fall into the picture? Well, the book of Acts, I submit, answers this question. I want us to be aware of this because the, when we read the book of Acts, and I've stressed this before, we need to realize we are reading Luke volume 2. And we can see this by comparing the respective beginnings of the Gospels. For instance, Luke chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4 says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you've been taught. That is how Luke prefaces his gospel. Well, the book of Acts begins very similarly. The first account I composed, Theophilus, 
about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, it's pretty clear that, you know, he's writing to Theophilus in both instances, and also that, you know, the first account, which would be Luke, would be about everything that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. That's the very last event that's recorded in the Gospel of Luke. So, the book of Acts and the book of Luke, I think, were written by the same person, uh, an author who sometimes inserts himself into the story of Acts. Uh, when we see the we sections of the book, several, you know, a good chunk of Acts, he's talking about they did this and they did that. And then there's portions of Acts where he talks about we did this and we did that. We sailed from Troas to Macedonia. And that's a point at which Luke himself actually becomes involved in the story. And although he never actually identifies himself by name, uh, you know, by process of elimination, he's not Paul, he's not Timothy, uh, he's one of Paul's other traveling companions that gets mentioned throughout uh, the epistles, and Luke seems probably the best uh, idea as many, and really outside of uh, his own books, and uh, he's not very well known, so we have that to think about. So if we're thinking about Acts as the, um, the basic sequel to Luke, the part two, then we realize that Acts is actually tying up a number of loose ends from the Gospel of Luke. For instance, Luke chapter 3 and verse 16. John promised that the one coming after him would baptize, would immerse in the Holy Spirit and in fire. You get to the end of Luke, that hasn't happened yet. It is fulfilled in the book of Acts. <coughs> Jesus is described as a light to the Gentiles in Luke chapter 2 and verse 32. Well, that still has yet to really be realized. Luke 9 and verse 27, Jesus says there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God coming with power. The kingdom was supposed to be established in their lifetimes. The kingdom is not realized until we get to the book of Acts, though. And in Luke chapter 11 and verse 49, Jesus makes reference to this event when he says... That for this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some of them they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. No. Jesus is talking about, you know, in one sense, of course, the Old Testament prophets that have been persecuted. But also this has reference to those people that Jesus has yet to send. The apostles. The apostles have not really been persecuted in the Gospels. Jesus is the one who receives the brunt of rage from the oppressors. But, you know, you get to the end of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has been persecuted, Jesus has been wrongfully condemned, but the apostles, they, they get off pretty much intact. I mean, they run away when Jesus is arrested, but nothing really happens to them, except Judas, who kills himself. All of that changes and acts. All of these things take place in the book of Acts. And so the book of Acts really kind of ties up all of these different loose ends. There is also, I think, a deliberate parallel between when we read the book of Luke and we saw Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem and how that dominates a good chunk of the narrative. Well, there's a good chunk of the narrative that is dominated by Paul's journey. More specifically, Paul's journey to Jerusalem where he gets arrested and shipped off to Rome. One of the longest sections of the book is devoted to that idea. Uh, so, you know, that Luke is intentionally drawing a parallel. He wants us to see the parallel between Jesus and Paul. And how Paul has become in many ways like Christ whom he follows. The book of Acts, why was it written? Was it a history book? Well, yes. But it is a selective history. Um, you know, we call it the Acts of the Apostles. That's really a man-made title uh, because the book itself never refers to itself as that. And it's a little misleading, actually, because we don't learn about the Acts of all of the Apostles. Uh, you know, in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century, some very imaginative people wrote some very lengthy works about Acts of the Other Apostles. There's a book called the Acts of John. There's a book called the Acts of Peter. Uh, there's a book called the Acts of Philip. It's very long. And it's they're all very imaginative, too, about some of the things that these apostles did. Uh, it, human, humankind likes to fill in the blanks with speculation when we don't have all the answers. But it's not all the apostles, and it's not all of their acts, either. Uh, in fact, really, 
when you read the book and you look at who it focuses on, only Peter and Paul receive an extensive amount of attention. The first 12 chapters of the book focus primarily on the exploits of the Apostle Peter. And then the last uh, 13 through 28, I can't do math for some reason today, those last chapters of the book focus primarily on the exploits of the Apostle Paul. Uh, now, I mean, you could suggest a better title, uh, you know, Acts of the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Uh, but uh, there's a couple of other chapters that are devoted to the work of men like Philip the Evangelist and Stephen the Deacon. Uh, neither of those men were apostles at all, and yet we still learn things about their acts as well. Uh, but regardless of what you want to call the book, uh, I also like the title, All That Jesus Continued to Do and Teach, because uh, in some respects, that's what's going on here. Uh, the geography is limited. You know, we know that the Christians existed in places like Egypt and uh, Yugoslavia and even as far as India uh, at some point during the second century, but we don't know how they got there. Acts only tells us about the journey from Palestine to Samaria to Syria to Asia Minor to Greece. And if I had been thinking, I would have included a map in this presentation to show you that. But uh, we will, we'll be looking at maps as we go along, I'm sure. Um, there's, by the time Paul gets to Rome in Acts 28, there's already a church there. In fact, it's already there before he ever writes a letter to them. You get that impression from reading the book of Romans. How did that church get there? We don't know, because the book of Acts doesn't tell us. The book of Acts is not telling us an all-inclusive account of the history of early Christians. It's selective. It's picking and choosing what it tells us. And eventually, well, we're told nothing about it coming to Alexandria in Egypt or other parts in Africa. We're told nothing about the gospel coming to Crete or Illyricum or Mesopotamia, even though we know it went there. The book is also... Yeah. The book is also has a large number of people giving speeches. And I think we really need to be impressed that over a quarter of the book is devoted to just speeches that people are giving. Some of them are sermons, but some of them are other kinds of speeches as well. For instance, legal defenses. A good chunk of the latter part of the book of Acts, you know, people like to study Acts for the conversion cases. Uh, Acts 23 through 28 don't really have very many conversion cases, if any. Because the bulk of it is Paul on trial before the Romans and legal defenses that he is giving before various councils. And in every... Well, you know, sometimes the book of Acts tells us the same story more than once. For instance, Paul's conversion story is told three times once we actually read about it in Acts chapter 9. But then Paul himself recounts the story in great detail in two of his speeches in Acts 22 and in Acts chapter 26. And... It, the point of this is to show that you know, Acts chooses to emphasize and tell us a lot of things, but also chooses to not answer some of the questions that are in our curiosity. I have a lot of questions about you know, what the other apostles were doing, and about where the gospel was going besides Macedonia and Greece, and about some of the gaps in the chronology. And you know why? I don't have answers to those questions. I need to be content with that. Because what the Lord has given us is sufficient for our understanding. The book is also not meant to be read selectively. Uh, I think, and I, I don't want to, you know, make accusations or make, uh, you know, characterizations. Um, growing up, I've had a lot of, I've, I, I talk a lot about books of the Bible that are neglected, like Leviticus or Ezekiel or things like that. The book of Acts has not been one such book in my upbringing. I think there's been a lot of classes that I had sat in on in the book of Acts growing up. But the classes almost always tend to focus on the same thing, which is, you know, conversion cases in the book of Acts. And rightly so, because there's a lot of them. Um, you know, there's at least a good 14 of them by my count. But Acts is not merely a list of people that got converted. It's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. It's like if you read the stories of Jesus and all you talked about was the miracles and you ignored his teachings and you ignored the crucifixion. But I'd say you'd be missing a pretty important chunk of the story, wouldn't you? It's not, a, nor is the book of Acts exclusively a manual on how to be saved. There is instruction about that in there, certainly. I won't deny that. And it's not merely a handbook of stuff we're supposed to do in church. Now, that's, uh, again, kind of the way that it gets treated more or not, 
or less, is people come to the book of Acts, they sometimes have this, you know, this agenda, I want to take this and immediately go out and apply it in the factory on Monday morning, or I want to apply it to what we do here on Sunday morning. And I don't think that's the point. That's part of it, but that's not the whole picture. We must first read the text for what it meant, and then, only then, can we decide what, what we are supposed to do and apply for ourselves. We don't do that with any other book of the Bible, and we shouldn't do that with the book of Acts. Um, I don't think we should forsake everything else it has to offer in the interests of pursuing and proving a few pet points. And that's not what we're going to do in this study. Uh, now, I want to be careful about this. The book of Acts, how do we outline this book? Um, I expressed great frustration over how to outline Luke. Um, I have, at least with Acts, I have an idea. It may not be a good idea. I'll let you judge it for yourselves, but uh, we can go with this. Some people have suggested a geographical outline based on Jesus' statement in chapter 1 and verse 8. He says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. That's the lesson, the basic point of the book, I think, is that the apostles are testifying to the risen Jesus. Jesus is the risen Christ. He's risen from the dead. Now God is king in this world, and everybody should submit to his rule and repent from their wicked ways. That testimony starts in Jerusalem, which is the bulk of the first seven chapters, and then it spreads to Judea and the rest of Samaria. We see that in chapters 8 through 12. And then it spreads to the uttermost limits of the known world. Chapter 12, verse 28. Well, chapter, chapters 12 through 28, excuse me. <coughs> I do think that there's a, we can get even a little more specific than that, though. <coughs> there's, a, there's kind of a repeated idea that comes up, and some of you have heard me talk about this before. There's a repeated combination of ideas that recurs throughout the book. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. The word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Acts 9 and verse 31. The church throughout all Judea and Galilee in Samaria enjoyed peace. Being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit it continued to increase. Acts 12, verses 24 and 25. The word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Acts 16 and verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in their faith and were increasing in number daily. Acts 19 and verse 20. The word of God was growing mightily and prevailing. Now why do I bring that up? You know, Luke changes up the vocabulary throughout. But he keeps bringing up this idea of increasing, or growing, or spreading, or strengthening, all throughout. And it's at these very specific points in the story. Um, <clears throat> he also changes his description of what grows, which I think is interesting. Chapter 6 and verse 7, it's the Word of God that's growing. In 931, it's the congregation that's growing. In 1224, it's the Word of the Lord. In 165, it's the congregations, the churches. 19 and verse 20, the Word of the Lord. And in Acts uh, 28, verse 31, which I did not include up here, <clears throat> talks about Paul proclaiming the kingdom of God. Uh, some people have also suggested I throw in Acts 2.47. The Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. What I think these verses are is they are basically like little markers to show the end of a section and the beginning of a new section. And I would propose this six-part outline as a result. Uh, the gospel starts in Jerusalem, chapter 1, 1 through 6, verse 7. It then spreads to Samaria and Judea, 6, 8 through 9, 31. It is then given to the Gentiles, 9, 32 through 12, 25. It is then given to the, uh, more specifically, there's a controversy over the, uns of the circumcision issue, so it's given to the uncircumcised in 13, 1 through 16, 5. It then spreads into Europe in 16, 6 through 19, 20. And finally, the bulk of the end of the book, is the gospel in Roman courts themselves, being put on trial. Some people actually think that uh, the book of Acts was composed as part of Paul's legal defense before the Romans. I don't know. That's possible, but I can't prove it. Um, and so I'll just leave that to somebody, to the consideration of people who are smarter than I am. Um, if this is structure marker is correct, we kind of have a, a way to organize the story a little bit in our minds. I think that's very helpful.
example, in Jerusalem, this first part, we have a series of major events. The ascension of Jesus, the outpouring of the Spirit, an initial opposition from the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and the Jerusalem congregation making provision for the poor brethren. Uh, the geographic focus is obviously on Jerusalem, because that's what I titled the section. Uh, it's largely focused on the preaching of Peter. And there's two speeches that are pretty dominatable in this section. Two speeches that show Christ as the fulfillment of Jewish prophecy. Uh, that's Acts 2 and Acts 3. Two sermons, like almost back to back, showing how Jesus ties together all of these different Old Testament themes. The second part, to Samaria, um, how do we get from Jerusalem to Samaria? Well, it lead, begins with these events. Stephen is put on trial and executed, uh, and there's a pronounced persecution from Saul, who held the coats of the men who killed Stephen. It, this persecution results in people going to Samaria and converting Samaritans. The Samaritans were like half Jew and half Gentile, so we might say the Gentiles are halfway in at this point. And then, just very suddenly, out of the blue, Saul, who is orchestrating all these persecutions, is converted. He only persecutes them long enough to get them out there, and then he's converted, and now he's part of the Jesus movement. Geographic focus on Judea and Samaria. Largely focused on the preaching of Stephen and Philip, who were two of the, uh, the servants, or I, I think they were deacons, in, that were appointed in Acts chapter 6 and verses 1 through 7. The longest speech in this, there's one speech that dominates this section, and it's Stephen's speech in Acts 7. And the primary function of that speech is to condemn the Jewish rejection of the prophets, namely Jesus. You know, he ends that sermon by saying, which of the prophets did you not kill? Which of the prophets did you not persecute? You've now put to death the Jesus. You know, even though, you know, you, and you rejected the law, even though it was ordained by angels. Well, that Jewish rejection of Jesus leads to this spreading of the gospel to other people. You see how the providence of God is working in this story. The third section, to the Gentiles, um, the major events of this section include basically the conversion of Cornelius and his family. Cornelius is not a Samaritan. He's not a Jew. He's just a full-blooded Gentile. Connected with that, we have another significant martyrdom, the death of James and almost death of Peter, who was imprisoned. And there's a relief effort that goes on for the uh, famine that happened during the reign of Claudius, where uh, Paul and Barnabas are involved in bringing uh, funds to the needy saints at Jerusalem. Geographic focus has gotten a little wider. It's now on the Palestinian region. Uh, Antioch in Syria has been included in this. There's a focus on the preaching of Peter, although we see Saul and Barnabas coming in and out of the story a little bit. And the longest two speeches in this section are both centered around one event. The conversion of Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11. Acts 10, Peter actually preaches his sermon to Cornelius and he gives a long speech about that. Acts 11, somebody then goes and says, well, what in the world are you doing eating with this uncircumcised pagan? And Peter has to give another speech, which is basically a retelling of everything that happened in Acts 10, in order to show that the Holy Spirit has in fact indicated that the Gentiles are part of the people of God. And you see, again, how the, the speeches is, are telling us what the most significant event in the section is. <coughs> we get a little further to the uncircumcised. The uh, first major event in this section is Paul's first missionary journey. Um, sometimes we talk about Paul having three or four missionary journeys. And the Jerusalem council that gets together on the issue of circumcision. This is the only time that uh, a council of people ever get together to make ecumenical decisions in the Bible. And as far as I'm concerned, the only council that has any authority or leaning today. Um, the geographic focus has gotten a little further out. It's now on Cy the island of Cyprus and the region of Galatia. Uh, it was around this time, I believe, also that the book of Galatians was actually written in this part. Uh, the focus is now on the preaching of Paul. And the longest speech is Acts 13, which if you look at Acts 13 and you look at Acts 2, they're very similar to each other. They're almost, almost like mirror images of the same ideas. Some of the same passages even get quoted. The idea is to show Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy. But again, you see the same cycle going through. Paul preaches that sermon in a synagogue 
And then when the Jews reject Jesus, he then turns around and goes to the Gentiles. Well, all this converting of Gentiles that's going on prompts the issue. And the issue of circumcision, which is why another key speech in this section is the speeches of James and Peter, which deal with the circumcision issue in Acts chapter 15. This is going to come up. If you bring Gentiles into the people of God, if you bring them into this, what is otherwise a predominantly Jewish movement, at some point somebody's going to ask the question, do people have to be circumcised in order to become Christians? And the decisive answer that is given is no. It's a monumental thing. That would have been a monumental idea for a lot of Jews in that day to swallow. I mean, that's part of the covenant with Abraham. You're just going to cast that aside? And the point is that, no, the gospel is freely offered to all, and circumcision is not part of that gospel. At least not of the flesh is it part of that gospel. That's a key to this whole thing. Then we have the gospel spreading to Europe. Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 through 19 and verse 20. And two ma several major events. Uh, this is the second and third part of the third missionary journeys. I keep putting missionary journeys in quotes because I, I, I kind of feel weird calling Paul's third missionary journey a journey. Because if your definition of journey is he moves to Ephesus for three years, then I guess that's a journey. But he spends three years... How, I mean, if you were to go to some place and stay there for three years, I don't know if you'd call that a journey. I think you'd call that, you know, I just had a change of residency. That's what Paul basically does. He moves to Ephesus and preaches there for three solid years. Um, and that becomes his new base of operations. <clears throat> but... Uh, uh, you know, it includes preaching in Macedonia and Athens and Corinth and Ephesus. You know, predominantly pagan cities. Places where the Greeks were more in dominant. Places like Asia Minor where the emperor cult was more in vogue. Uh, places where the gospel was being... Uh, it's being spread even more and more into the Gentile people. The geographic focus is on these Greek areas. Macedonia, Achaia, and Ephesus in Asia Minor. Focuses again on the preaching of Paul. And... Here's the interesting thing. The longest speech, in fact, the only speech in this entire section is in Acts 17. The Sermon on Mars Hill. A sermon clearly addressed to a pagan audience. A sermon that uses very little, if any, of the Old Testament. A sermon that makes a case for God, saying that this unknown God that you worship in ignorance is the God that we are now proclaiming to you. That God overlooked your times of ignorance, but He is now proclaiming to all men everywhere they might repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world through a man whom he has appointed, has furnished proof to all men through the resurrection of the dead. You see how the gospel is becoming gradually less Judaized and gradually more put out to all nations, all men everywhere. That's part of the growth theme in the book of Acts. The gospel is not limited to a specific group or ethnicity. It's not limited to a specific class of people. It starts with Judaism, but it becomes something more. Because God's plan isn't just to restore Israel to Himself, but to restore all nations to Himself. That from the beginning of the world, when God created all nations from one and blood, made all nations of the earth, well, from that point on, God has been trying to restore all things to Himself. That's part of what the book of Acts is about. It's how that's done through the preaching of Jesus Christ. Finally, the last section of the book, and obviously the longest, chapters 19 through 28, um, the gospel is defended before the Romans. Major event, Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's arrested, put on trial, deported to Rome. Does that sound familiar? He travels to Jerusalem. He's arrested. He's put on trial, and he's handed over to the Romans. Sounds a lot like what happened to Jesus, isn't it? Now, the difference is Paul doesn't die in the story. Jesus did. But God's goal here was for Paul to testify before uh, those who were in Rome. And what is interesting about this is this section of the book has more speeches than any other. Four major speeches. Acts 20, Paul gives his farewell to the Ephesian elders, telling them that they will not see him again. You know, he doesn't know the end result of what's going to happen, but he does know that he's going to be brought to Rome. There's a series of trials. He defends himself again and again before the Sanhedrin, before Governor Felix, and before Herod Agrippa. Does that sound familiar? It sounds exactly like Luke's progression of trials in the Gospel of Luke. Luke records three of Jesus' trials. One before the Sanhedrin, 
One before the governor and one before Herod. Now, it's a different governor and it's a different Herod and it's probably a different Sanhedrin, but it's the same progression. And every time that Paul is on trial, every time that he gives a speech, he makes sure to emphasize one thing that he is on trial for. The resurrection of the dead. Acts 23 and verse 6. Perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Acts 24 and verse 21, when he's before the governor Felix, he says, well, in verses 20 and 21, Let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council, other than for this one statement which I shouted, For while standing among them for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. And again in Acts chapter 26 and verse 23. I'll start in verse 22. Having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what Moses and the prophets said was going to take place, that the Christ was going to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. <coughs> and you know how the book ends? It ends in Rome on kind of a cliffhanger. Oh, what do we do with that? We get to Acts 28. Paul goes to Rome and he gets a mixed response among the Jewish people. Some people are persuaded in verse 24 and others would not believe. And Paul proclaims the gospel to the Gentiles in that area as well. We learn from Philippians that he has everyone in the Praetorian Guard knew exactly who he was and what he was on trial for. And that, you know, whether you liked him or you hated him, you knew what Paul stood for. He stood for the resurrection of the dead. That's the thing we all need to stand for as well. The book ends on a cliffhanger. Paul's in prison in Rome, and Luke says in verses 30 and 31, he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching and concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. And I don't know if you're like me, but if you're like me, you read books, the first question you're going is, what happened after the two years? Did he get off? Did he get out of prison? Does this book just end abruptly? What do we do with that? What happens to Paul? Now, of course, the most popular suggestion, and this may be right, is that this is the point where Luke writes the book. And if you take the idea that this is in fact a legal defense, this has to be the point at which Luke writes the book. Um, I think there's something else too. You know, I mean, why not just add an editorial note after the fact that, you know, Paul did get off? Why not satisfy our curiosity? Because we know from history that he did. I think it's a reminder of something. What happens to Paul isn't the point. Reminder, because the point is never been, the story was never about Paul. The story was never about Peter. The story was never about the apostles. The story was always about Jesus. The preaching of Jesus is never finished. You know what you see in verse 30 and 31? You see absolute success. Because whether Paul gets off or whether he is executed, he preached the kingdom of God and taught concerning the Lord Jesus with all openness, unhindered, in one of the most heavily populated and one of the most powerful and one of the most wicked cities in the world. And he did it unhindered. That's called success as far as the gospel is concerned. And it is a reminder that if Luke is about all that Jesus began to do and teach, Acts is all about what Jesus continued to do and teach through the apostles, the story is not finished. Let me ask you a question. What is Jesus doing and teaching today? And who is he working through today? Just as Jesus continued to act and teach through the apostles, he ought to continue to act and teach through each and every one of us today as we proclaim that same message of the kingdom of God and the resurrection of the dead, unhindered. And if Acts is volume 2, your life is volume 3. As the Spirit moved the apostles to preach the word and defend the faith, so likewise the Spirit should move us to preach the word and defend the faith. Just as they bore witness to Christ's resurrection and His Lordship, so we should bear witness to Christ's resurrection and His Lordship. That is the book of Acts in a nutshell. Powerful message. One that convicts me. And one that I hope has convicted all of us. I want to ask yourself another question. 
But I would have each of us ask ourselves a question. Where do we stand in relation to that gospel message? Are we part of the kingdom of God that has been proclaimed there? Have we been united with Christ in His death and His burial and His resurrection? Have we been immersed for the forgiveness of our sins? Have we received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Are we striving with our lives, with our words and with our deeds to proclaim and defend Jesus Christ as Lord? Peter said that if you sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, you should always be ready to make a defense for the hope that is in you. That is what we each need to do. If you're here this morning and you feel like there's some way that you can do better and you feel like there's some way that this congregation can help you, if we could perhaps bring you to the Lord by immersing you into Christ, or perhaps we can encourage you and strengthen you in the Lord so that you, like them, can grow and be strengthened. Now is an appropriate time to let that be known. Won't you do that while together we stand and we sing?